Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Agent is In. We're celebrating CF Engine's 30th anniversary, birthday, I don't know, CF Engine's 30. And Mark Burgess, the original creator, um, has joined us today for a little chat. He's a theoretical physicist, computer scientist. He's known for basically pioneering configuration management, um, promise theory, which is applied in all kinds of different domains, not just computer science. Um, he developed the first um, master's degree in network and systems administration. He's authored many books. He's a painter and also a musician and a foodie. So he's quite an interesting person to talk to, and I'm, I'm super glad that uh, he could join us today. Hello, Mark. Hello, Nick. Thank you for having me. Thanks. So with CF Engine turning 30, um, I was doing a lot of thinking recently kind of about, you know, CF Engine's past and how we got to where we are. And so I kind of wanted to start with asking you about the beginning. So before CF Engine, like what drew you to physics to begin with? So the beginning sort of started with the Big Bang. And then, you know, all the galaxies formed, there was the hydrogen age. And if we skip over a few uh, billion years um, to when I was born, I was uh, a nerdy little kid who watched Star Trek and Doctor Who and enjoy Doctor Who, uh, who's also having an anniversary this year, by the way. <laughs> um, I loved watching those shows and was inspired by them to get into technology and into science. And I guess as a teenager, I would read whatever books I could get hold of. Uh, Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote a lot of science as well as science fiction. Um, Paul Davies, who wrote popular books in physics at the time, he eventually became my professor at the university, and so on. You know, many of these um, uh, popular authors writing about physics, black holes, the only universe, da di da di da. Uh, all of that got me keen to to want to go into science, and. You know, I sometimes wonder how I got there because, as many of you know who've been to school yourselves, when you study science in school, it's so boring. They give you all the worst, most boring things to study, like uh, little trucks rolling down planes, um, maybe heating up some water and seeing how fast it evaporates. <laughs> You're literally watching paint dry. Uh, and you study this and, and calculate things, and it's it's mind-bogglingly dull. But for whatever reason, perhaps because I was emboldened by Star Trek, I, I stuck on with it and got to university, by which time it starts to become quite interesting. So that's sort of what got me on the path to, to science and technology in the first place. Yeah, science fiction always seems like a good on-ramp. Back then, of course, there were no computers, right? So I... I saw a computer for my for the first time when I was uh, about sixteen, I suppose, uh, in somebody's office. It fit in the office. Good. It was a Commodore PET standing in somebody's the headmaster's office in our school, and my dad was a bit of a, a, a geek for gadgets. He was totally an educated man, but he loved to get new gadgets and things, so he talked about us perhaps getting a computer and we started to collect leaflets you know they printed glossy brochures of, of uh, circuit boards and things that you could plug together to make a computer back in those days and it was around the time that um, Clive Sinclair Sir Clive Sinclair famous Brit uh, created the ZX81 and then the Sinclair Spectrum which had these beautiful rubber keys looked like you would use, you know, like an erase, a keyboard made of erasers, tiny little thing, basically a games computer. And we looked at getting one of these and, and 
I changed schools at this time, went to the upper school, which is kind of like high school, I guess, in US. And um, got to know a chap there in my physics class, and he had bought a BBC micro, a BBC B, which was made by a company called Acorn Computers. Long story, uh, bought by Olivetti, became ARM, you know, the very famous chip maker now. Um, and I bought one of these BBC B computers. It was a fabulous thing. It's the most programmable, um, decomposable, put back togetherable, expandable thing you've ever seen in your life. And that's what got me eventually to touch a computer and learn about that. But that's uh, moving on a bit. Yeah. So, so you, you got into science fiction <laughs> and a little bit into to computing. And then um, you went to school, like you went up to Norway. What took you to Norway? Oh my goodness. So uh, yeah, we jumped from the big bang to, to my birth. So that's, a, that's another sort of major epoch of universal history. <clears throat> I, uh, I went to study in Newcastle upon Tyne, which is in the north of England, because of Paul Davis, the, the popular science writer who was the professor that had just got, got his first professorship. Um, and um, went through all kinds of different physics. So I, I joined to, to do cosmology and astrophysics, but I switched to theoretical physics and then switched to non-theoretical physics, ordinary physics, because the theoretical physics course didn't have enough people interested. <laughs> it was just me in the end. So they weren't gonna do that just for me. So I ended up uh, studying physics and then being, you know, a bear of little brain, had no clue what I was going to do after that. Um, I only know, knew that I wanted to be some kind of sciencey person. And um, it was suggested that I might do a PhD. And, you know, I didn't have a clue what a PhD was at that time, but I thought, okay, if I don't have to decide what to do next, then cool, I'm in. So I did a PhD as you do. And uh, at the end of that, again, I had no clue what to do. <laughs> Still a bear of little brain. It hadn't helped much. But um, I had during that time stayed in dorms with some Norwegians. Uh, many Norwegians, it turns out, came to Newcastle on the ferry across the sea to uh, pillage and whatnot. Um, live the life in sunny Newcastle upon time. And I got to know them and I'd actually been on a couple of trips to Norway, mountaineering and skiing and so on, uh, sleeping in tents in minus 20 degrees and horrible things like that. And I thought, well, you know, I enjoy the mountaineering. I don't really know where to go. I couldn't stay in the UK. So that's another part was I got a, a fellowship actually from the Royal Society of London. Should probably say that with a posh voice, the Royal Society of London. And they are sort of hard won things to get hold of, but I managed to get a grant for two years to go somewhere. It couldn't be where I was, it couldn't be the UK, but it could be anywhere in Europe. So I thought, okay, Norway, I've been there. Let's see what's going on there. And I had heard of one person in physics in Norway, and I wrote him a letter and said, How would you like to have this? Um, bear of little brain sitting in a corner with his own money for a couple of years doing stuff with things. And he wrote back, he invited me for a, for a chat, flew to Norway and uh, met Finn Rondal, who is, um, turns out uh, had been student and co-worker of Richard Feynman, very interesting guy. Um, we got along very well. So I, jumped on the ferry and uh, and came to Norway. So did he know since? Indeed. So did he kind of rekindle? I mean, how did you get then from still PhD physics to 
I'm going to write some software to manage some computers. So you just jumped another epoch of universal history, right? Yeah. So, so we've had the Big Bang, birth, PhD, moved to Norway. Mm -hmm. um, so I came to Norway as a postdoc in physics, of course, um, theoretical physics. And, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> two years passed. Um, during that time, um, another physicist who became quite famous called Jon Magna Linus joined the department. He was the guy who, who um, invented anions. There's a, something called particle type called anions, did you know? Bosons, fermions, fermions, anions, any old thing. Uh, and these things were topological particles still very much um, discussed today. He became professor and brought with him a bunch of money. And with that money, they decided to buy a bunch of Sun workstations. So this is now 1990. And uh, the Sun workstation was kind of the bee's knees of Unix uh, computing at the time. So we bought these uh, Sun workstations and, and guess who got to install them? Um, the university came and, and had sent somebody who didn't quite know what he was doing, made a bit of a mess of it. But I was watching very carefully all, all of the things that he was doing and I was learning a bit about Unix, very interesting. And so I eventually became the one that uh, repaired these things and, and installed them and looked after them and made new accounts when people needed them and so forth. So, you know, you get sucked into these machines, don't you? Um, and after a couple of years, it had become it had come to the point where I was spending too much time doing the system administration and not enough time doing the physics and other things that I wanted to. So I thought, how could I automate these uh, these things? And I had a discussion with some people at the university. Um, one of my friends still here in Norway, uh, Bjorn Remset, was uh, at the UCIT, was the the university's computing service back then. He had written a bunch of shell scripts, right, which I found to be very impressive. So these shell scripts ran every hour, every day, every week, doing kind of tidy up jobs. And they ran across the whole university campus, not just physics. And they gave us these scripts and we installed them and ran them. They did backups, things like this, very useful. And um, uh, I thought these things were, you know, marvelous bits of automation, almost smart. And I wanted to use that idea and go on and, and see how I could simplify the tasks that I had and, and could take it even further because they still did very simple things. And I looked at these scripts and they were just awful, horrendous. It was if this, then that, if else, this, else, if that other thing. Because back then there were like 50 flavors of Unix and they were all totally different. <laughs> Pardon me. I'm going to do that, you know. These Unix types, there were, you know, there was SunOS, SunOS 4, SunOS 5, there was HPUX, there was AIX4, AIX5, AIX6, so many of these things. And they were totally different animals with shell commands that had totally different options. So you couldn't just write one script that would run everywhere like you can today, because Linux is basically Linux. You had to say, if this is Sun OS 4 version before 3, then they didn't have that uh, command installed yet. Then the path will be USR, UCB, bin, something, and so on and so on. There were like a, a thousand cases for every simple thing you wanted to do. <laughs> uh, not going to happen. So I looked at this and thought, you know, could we simply strip away all of those if then else statements and, and, and automate the detection of where uh, something was being run and have it figure that out and then go straight to the kernel to, to do these things instead of using flaky shell commands that were different everywhere. Just go straight to the operating system to do these things because all the system calls were there. The shell commands totally different. So why don't write a program in C um, 
And by chance, I'd written a book on C when I was a, a student, um, back in the days when we thought that C was going to be like the basic of the 16-bit computers. Um, you know, the 16-bit computers didn't actually last long enough to have basic uh, developed for them because they were pretty quickly replaced by 32. But, but nonetheless, C became popular around that time. And I wrote, I think, the second book ever on C. Uh, no, it was the third or fourth, but anyway. Um, so I wrote CF Engine as a kind of Christmas vacation project uh, and tried to completely separate the logic of figuring out where you were and, and what the environment was from what it was that you wanted to do so that you could see clearly what you intended. Right? So what is the desired configuration? Uh, <coughs> the language is a little bit different back then, simpler, closer to what some of you know as CF Engine 2, but even not as well developed. And it did only a few simple things like um, you know, making symbolic links, running commands, copy, didn't copy fast back then. Um, uh, a few of these things, I forget exactly what. And, um, and we installed it and it ran, it was very successful. Um, so you came back from Christmas break and instead of skiing or mountaineering or freezing in a tent, you sat down and coded. So what was like, what was the reception like? I mean, CF Engine is so different from anything else that I, uh, especially back when I was first introduced to it, it's so different from everything else. I mean, what was, what was the reception like? What did they think of, you know, this different way? There were varied responses. <laughs> So uh, some of my colleagues thought it was cool. Some of them said, you think you're clever, don't you? <laughs> you think you're cleverer than us, don't you? We didn't think of that. So you, you did that thing, think you're somebody. Um, and I suppose I didn't really care too much because it was just for me to use for the, and then it's kind of spread around the physics department. It was only later that somebody suggested to me that I should make it open source or, or actually free software back then. And <clears throat> should just donate this code to the GNU Software Foundation. Um, before that, I actually published this uh, preprint, which is somewhere on my website, a preprint is something like a paper that you write and, and distribute around physics departments. And this got distributed to other physics departments and a couple of them asked me for the code. And I ended up going to CERN and giving a talk about it amongst the uh, the systems folks at CERN <clears throat> who were also a little bit snotty, <laughs> it has to be said. Um, but anyway, I came back and I decided I was gonna just donate the code to, to GNU and Richard Stallman called me up and said, lovely, we'd like to do that. You should make a few changes because it's it's good, but there are some things I suggest doing this and that. And the suggestions are actually quite good. So I made a few changes and stuck it on the GNU website, which I think was by then sort of like the second major version of, uh, of the original thing. It wasn't CF Engine 2. It was still pre-CF Engine somehow, but uh, it was still the second version for me. And anyway, so it got uh, <clears throat> it got onto the GNU website, and I sort of forgot about it for a while. But at that time, I I was forced to change jobs because the money was sort of running out in physics, and my I was coming to the end of my my stipend or stipend or whatever you say, and. Um, one of my colleagues next door told me about a job at the technical university in town, lecturing in Unix. And I thought, oh, I could probably do that. So I went for an interview and I got that job. <coughs> Excuse me. And started teaching 
computers there for a living instead. So, because there was no money in physics at that time, I, I was, it just wasn't an option to continue with physics. So I decided to do physics as a hobby, as I'd done physics as a hobby. So switch physics and computers, hobby, job, switch, uh, and just keep going. So very little change, except I had to start lecturing in Norwegian, which was interesting. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, as part of the, the kind of research that I wanted to do, I wrote a paper about the locking mechanism in CF Engine, you know, the famous if elapsed and expire after uh, locks together with a colleague there called Demosthenes Skipitaris, who I still have contact with. And we wrote this paper together and took it to Lisa, USNIX Lisa in 1997. And uh, when I got there, I, I gave my paper and nobody understood very much. They looked at the CF engine thing and said, oh, is it a kind of, what is it? Is it a kind of fancy Chrome? I said, well, you could say that, but maybe it's a bit more than that. Anyway, I left that behind and, and I had set up this birds of a feather session. And at these conferences, you know, you give these birds of a feather sessions for anyone who's interested. I'm going to talk about, you know, the paintings of, uh, of um, <clears throat> Monet or something, and people will come to that session and see if they're interested, and if they're not, they will go. So anyway, I put CF Engine, anyone wants to come, GNU CF Engine, I think it was then. And uh, didn't think much about it, so I went to this tiny little hotel room, which they'd booked for the session, and I couldn't get in. It was room for about maybe 60 to 100 people, and it was packed. I'd never seen so many people in this room. And in the end, I, I had to I had like a square meter to stand in, and there were people sitting on the floor, cross-legged, like at my feet, and then standing outside the door looking in to hear about this. And something had happened during that time, don't ask me what, but something had touched a nerve or sparked an idea in people and suddenly everybody was interested in this CF engine idea and had started to use it. Little did I know. And uh, that's kind of when I realized that I was onto something that was more than just a, you know, me trying to imitate Star Trek diagnostics. So after this like surprise um, gaggle of, of people who were interested, did that, did that fuel some drive to like, oh, I'm gonna work on this more? Or I mean, what took you from nobody understanding anything, all of a sudden there's a bunch of interest and you know, it was a GNU project that you kind of didn't pay much attention to, to kind of reinvesting and spending time to, you know, come up with what we know as CF Engine 2. So, you know, I'm, I'm a science-y guy. I, that was my, my dream, as it were. I wanted to do science. And I realized that just making a bunch of code, do stuff, isn't really science. So I asked myself, how could I use science to try to learn about and understand computers to figure out how to deal with them. Because the thing that had become clear to me during those years was that, yeah, you can configure a computer, you can install it, you can design it, but what it actually does is something else, right? It doesn't really do what it's been programmed to do. Its behavior is emergent and it's constantly being influenced by other computers, things that users type, what's happening on the network and so on. All of these influences are perturbing this machine and it's it's behaving like some natural phenomenon that we don't really understand. But I thought, okay, I want to understand it. This is way easier than trying to understand physics where you need to you know, crash atoms together at high speed in a, at CERN to try to figure out anything. I could try smashing computers together, but probably easier just to try start observing them like, you know, like animals in the wild and 
and just start by watching and, and measuring and monitoring and see what I could understand about it. And so I looked around at the literature and it seemed nobody had actually tried that before because people had thought of computers as something to do with engineering, not really a science subject. Or they had thought about it as mathematics, so logic, if you like. Um, but nobody had thought of it as a science in the sense that you observe, you learn the patterns of behavior and try to explain them. So I thought, I want to do that. Um, and I didn't really know how to do it. So I, I started just measuring everything that I could. And that resulted in a bunch of papers called Measuring System Normality which took quite a long time to publish because the computer science um, milieu was pretty skeptical of this idea. They thought it was a bit of nonsense, right? Monitoring computers, who does that? Um, and yeah, you've got this little tool on your computer to plot these lines. And became CF monitor team. Um, <clears throat> but I, the thing, ironically, you brought this up just before we, we started. The thing that got me doing that was on the way back from that Lisa conference, I got sick on the plane like I just did now. And uh, as I was sitting there in my misery, thinking about sickness and health and, and so on, I realized that the that analogy of, of a computer being sick or not quite perfectly configured and then repairing it automatically is something like an immune response. <laughs> Pardon me. And so I started to study immunology as well and, and to get inspiration on how that could work. And came upon another group in uh, New Mexico who had had a similar idea, but they were doing it for computer viruses, whereas I wanted to do it for configuration state. Um, and uh, that was kind of what got me into the sciencey aspect of it. And it was very interesting because it took you know many years to, first of all, to gather data and then try to make a theory to describe it. And I, being a physicist, I thought, how do you apply methods of physics? Because physicists are usually pretty good at understanding behavior. It's what we do. Um, but the more I looked at these, things that I realized that there's something different from physics about computers. And that is, they're supposed to do what you want. You know, they may behave in a certain way and we can describe those behaviors in in certain way as we can describe gases and liquids and things in physics. But there's still this issue that it's supposed to do the thing you asked it to. And that doesn't really exist in physics, right? Um, unless you sort of, aim a ball and, and send it on a particular trajectory and hope it hits a target or something. So there was this idea of policy, what you want, the desired outcome of a thing, which wasn't really built into the descriptions that we'd use to describe behaviors in other areas. And so I wanted to figure out what to do with that. And by this time I was into teaching system administration master's level, I had to write a book uh, in order to teach the science of system administration. And I wrote this book called um, Analytical Methods in Network and System Admin, I think it was called. And I kind of reached the last chapter, putting everything that I could think of into this book, every method I could think of. But at the end, I had this question, you know, how do you describe intent? And how do you describe that matching between what you wanted to happen, what actually happened. And this is what eventually led me to promise theory, uh, starting out actually as a form of graph theory. So I, I look, I kind of 
went into every imaginable area of science and mathematics looking for something suitable and didn't quite find it. But I took little bits from here and little bits from there <laughs> and synthesized uh, promise theory. I, I didn't call it promise theory first, but that came later. But that's kind of how that happened. So you were developing what became promise theory kind of at the same time that you were formal, like putting together this, the things that we are familiar with from CF Engine 2. That's right. Yep. And it took a while, you know, but I had a lucky break in that because of the master's degree, um, another university, University of Amsterdam, had caught wind of what we were doing and they wanted to do a similar thing. And they sent a professor across to meet me. You know, there are all kinds of rules at universities. You can't just start a course in this or that and uh, and have the blessing of the powers that be to, to give a degree in that subject. It has to be approved by all kinds of bodies and quality assured and so on. And that means that you need um, <clears throat> you need certain professors to sign off that there's a sufficient amount of science in this to be called a master's degree. So anyway, they sent this, this guy across, Jan Bergstra, who is a professor of logic. Um, and uh, and my friend who I had known at Amsterdam said, you probably won't like him. He's a bit, he's a bit odd, a bit difficult to get along with. I said, oh, okay. Anyway, he showed up and we, we became great friends. <laughs> they immediately clicked um, because he was kind of odd in exactly the and stubborn in the way that I am, you know, not taking no for an answer here or insisting that there must be this there. And this has also gotten me into trouble with the sysadmin community often, you know, insisting on certain standard of things. <coughs> Pardon me. Anyway, Jan and I became great friends and we eventually began to discuss this idea of promise theory together because his background was logic. And he was intrigued by the idea that you could describe something called a promise as an act of voluntary cooperation, which is how I wanted to view it. You know, all of CF Engine is kind of based on this notion that the, the agent is, is a sovereign state on by itself. It cannot be influenced by outside. It won't listen to orders from outside automatically. You can only ask it if it would be willing to go along with something um, in order to send suggestions to it. If it will accept, it will do it. But the idea of promise in philosophy is the exact opposite of this. You know, philosophers have imagined promises as things that lead to obligations. That if you promise something, you must then you must then do it. You are obliged to do it. And that takes away the voluntary aspect of it. And they got in this uh, complete muddle about, it's, it's, it's called deontic logic in, in mathematics. They got into this enormous muddle about the meaning of a promise and had sort of denied the possibility of, of uh, voluntary action or voluntary cooperation. And, and Jan realized that this was nonsense. And he realized that this, the promise theory was sort of the, the solution to that issue in logic where 50 years of deontic logic had sort of resulted in nothing but contradictions in, in the way that they described these obligations. But we realized that you could develop a completely separate theory of promises that's totally self-consistent based on this idea of voluntary cooperation. And, and so we did that and, and that was sort of, it gave me a hook to hang CF engine ideas onto, I started to reinterpret everything that I'd done based on this more formal formulation of the ideas of what it means to have an intended outcome. I want the computer to be like this. What does that imply? Can I actually get there or not? Well, that depends on everything that I've promised and the possibly things that other people have promised. Mm -hmm. And so the notion of dependencies came into it. And suddenly we had a way of dealing with all of this that was very clean and didn't have to violate the sovereignty, if you will, of each individual computer. 
a lot of people have kind of been critical of that because in in a lot of companies people have the the notion that you know i just want the computer to do this it had better do as i say or else you're fine Very militant yeah basically a kind of military view but that's how companies work as a rule right but universities are not like that at all at a university every cat is a special child you know it's really hurting cats every professor wants the computer to be just like this and it must be exactly as i want it because there's no chance that i could simplify the life of, of these people managing the computers uh, by having some kind of a standard no nope, i want my etc in a dot d file to be in a totally different directory with a different name because i'm me and that's what universities are like in order to run cf engine in a university environment i had to live with that kind of attitude so to bring people along and to be able to <clears throat> create that service to configure and manage the systems for them they wanted it just so and i had to be able to adapt to that so you know i could say with the cf engine classes if it's a sonos 4 machine or a solaris 5 and it's the math department oh and it's fred then you have to do this otherwise everybody else just do this one this other thing's fine but you know it was all about the exceptions and being able to handle them gracefully not about forcing a kind of an imprint or cookie cutter approach to automation which was the standard way of dealing with mass production in well basically most automation circles so that was um, something that promise theory could handle it was designed to tackle that independence and to allow everything to be able to be merged together in a single knowledge base without any conflicts and that was a property we could prove that that was possible and that it wouldn't lead to contradictions as long as you followed these basic axioms that cf engine had been actually been designed to so it wasn't like I designed CF Engine based on the theory. I kind of understood the theory by making CF Engine somewhat intuitively. And then I went back and realized I could re-understand it. And so it was sort of an iterative mm -hmm. development of theory and practice alongside one another, which is always the best way, of course. So you're kind of developing promise theory and working on what became cf engine 2 what like at what point did you decide to release cf engine 2 and it was not gnu anymore right engine 2 was gnu for a while i, I mean it remained gnu throughout its life but i sort of parted company with richard stallman after a while he i found he became increasingly erratic and a bit annoying with his political thoughts and ideas. And so I kind of left that behind a little bit. <clears throat> and when I created CF Engine 3, that was a, a chance to make a clean break from that. But um, yeah. So, so how long did you spend then kind of reformulating CF Engine 2 to kind of make that align with the more formalized theory for mm -hmm. Well, so I, at some point in 2003, four, I don't know when exactly, I kind of stopped making changes to CF Engine 2. I decided I, enough is enough. I, I don't want to be stuck developing this, well, maintaining this thing, not doing anything new. And it was a bit too hard, you know, the, because of the way I designed it, there were some built-in limitations which were intended in the beginning, but you should never intend to simplify things too much because it's always a mistake. So anyway, I stopped maintaining the CF Engine 2 except for sort of bug fixes and, and so on. And uh, people started to get annoyed by me not simply implementing the latest idea that they'd had um in the way that they wanted it 
But I said, I've, I've got to step back and, and look at this and study the theory and try to understand it. And that's why I was doing all of these uh, promise theory things. Anyway, after a while, I, I realized that I, I finally understood it. I knew how to do it again, cleaner and better. And I kind of knew how to get past the limitations. I did some kind of um, proof of concept coding. <coughs> I looked at the possibility of using C++ to write uh, CF Engine 3. And I spent six months trying to develop the simplest of idioms in C++. It was nuts, nut job language. In the end, I, I threw my hands up with frustration and realized that it was just much, much harder and less easy to understand than, than regular C. So then I rewrote the entire thing all the proof of concepts in an afternoon in C that had taken me six months in C++ because I, I kind of just knew how to do it then. And I decided I was gonna leave the university and start a company as Luke had done with Puppet. You know? And that was a different, that was more of a personal thing. I was fed up with the university, felt like a dead end. And this seemed like a possible way out of that, that you know, maybe I could make a commercial success of CF Engine and, and pay for my research in the future to do interesting things instead of looking for grants and handouts and spare time to to do it alongside teaching. So what was like, um, I mean, looking at, you know, commercial developing commercial CF Engine and then, uh, I mean, I think companies typically have more money maybe than most universities and you've got this... Uh, kind of voluntary cooperation idea that maybe resonates really well at universities. So what was that like going into the commercial space and then, you know, talking to companies? Like, how did they receive those ideas? What was that like? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so by this time, by... We're now at around 2007-ish, I suppose. By this time, you could turn over any stone in the data center anywhere in the world. You'd pretty much find CF Engine under that stone. CF Engine 2, that is. Everyone was using it. Puppet was still getting started around that time, so they had very few kind of um, implementations, but CFN is still widely prevalent. So everyone was using it and they didn't really know about the theory or didn't care about the theory as long as it worked. <coughs> Excuse me. As long as it worked, they didn't, didn't care too much. But when you start a company and want to sell it, you need a sales pitch, right? You need a story. And that's when these marketing sort of experts began to tell me, oh, you should use this theory, university theory, sounds really good. Tell people that. And I think that's kind of a mixed, that was mixed advice. It wasn't the best advice because some people reacted very negatively towards that. Who the hell do you think you are in your ivory tower telling me how to do this and that? Other people thought it was extremely cool that finally they felt justified, you know, because a lot of sysadmins hadn't really been to formal college. They'd learned things the hard way. So the fact that somebody with an academic credential was then sort of validating what they believed, they thought that was very cool. So it was very much uh, polarized. And <laughs> if nothing else, I would say CF Engine has polarized people for and against like nothing else in the history of computing, maybe. Um, it's always kind of either appealed or, or made people run screaming um, early on. So you got the commercial launch done. You, you figured out a way to convince businesses that, you know, this other model is is going to be good. Um, I know scalability has always been something that 
that CF Engine is well known for. And I think a lot of that really has to do with kind of the fundamental design choices and voluntary cooperation. And, and I mean, just some of those very fundamental things. Um, I don't know. Um, what I guess, what were the biggest, what was the most interesting thing to some of those first customers? Like what did they see that was, you know, going to really change the way that they worked? I don't know that we changed anybody very much in the beginning, maybe later. But a lot of those people were already using CF Engine 2. And then we came along and said, no, look, now you can get support and you can have actually a, a more powerful CF Engine without those limitations that the, that the 2 still has. <laughs> and you can get this fancy dashboard with <clears throat> a story about knowledge integration and so on. Now, <clears throat> you may not know this, but when I started the company, I didn't think that you could sell configuration management, right? I mean, I was surprised that Luke wanted to do Puppet and the, I didn't think he could sell it either because see if engine was free, right? Everybody had it. What, what are you gonna buy? But I did think that you could sell knowledge management because doing stuff is easy, but understanding the monster you've created, that's hard. So my idea for CF Engine, commercial CF Engine, was the, the integration of knowledge, <clears throat> pardon me, all of the, the, the checklists that you get from being able to say that a promise has been kept, that self-monitoring that's done by the locking mechanisms we just we talked about before, um, the, the ability to show that your policy is not contradictory, self-contradictory, uh, to look at the variations in time and space and so on, to be able to show all of that and explain it to somebody in a certain way, and to use the machine learning aspects to show the patterns, the rhythms, the heartbeats of the machines, uh, what time of day is it busy, you know, when's a good time to do a backup, all of these things. <laughs> Pardon me. We could do, and I thought we could probably sell that because these large enterprises struggle with that kind of stuff and they have compliance issues that they need to report on and cf engine just had the model that was perfect for that so i remember when i when i i mean we're somewhere in the time around where i think i came into contact with cf engine and knowledge management was like one of those things that i thought was super different about cf engine and one of the things that i thought was like this little golden nugget you know, this ability to, you know, just kind of annotate that, you know, these are the the things that care about the, you know, this working, it's a department, maybe it's a person, maybe it's, you know, some other policy somewhere. And, you know, encoding that stuff, because, I mean, I was a sysadmin, and, you know, I had three wikis tarred up from, you know, the years before and every machine that I had to go manage, like I got to sift through these three different wikis where the knowledge went to die. And, you know, I compared that against like this idea of just being able to have active management that is also functioning in large part as my knowledge base. And I was just really interested in like, I mean, the whole thing of managing computers is just a big knowledge management problem. And so that's like, like beyond CF Engine, that's kind of like one of my other super areas of interest. Like, how do you wrangle all this stuff? And so I do want to detour for a moment with physics, computer science, software development, painting, music, food, all of that. I mean, how do you manage your own knowledge? Like how how do you are there tools? Do you have processes? Is it just luck? It's easy. I just forget it. <laughs> I forget it much too often. <laughs> no, I um, <clears throat> I use this the pen. I make notes. I write notes with a pen. Always have ever since I 
it's a sort of a mathematics habit, I think, to writing with a fountain pen. And I, I enjoy the act of writing. I hate getting close to a computer because all the imagination gets sucked out of you and you have to type. There are things flashing at you, you know, type something, type something, type something. And then you say, oh. But when you're sort of relaxed with a pen, sitting, have a cup of tea, the, the thoughts just flow and I make sure I write them down and then I read them back. I read my notebooks back to me, to myself. So that's how I kind of do it, I suppose. Yeah. All right, um, so get back on topic there with like, you thought you could sell knowledge management. Yeah, but but you know the industry had other ideas. So mm -hmm. um, something else was happening in the industry at this time, which I hadn't thought about or factored in while I was busy writing Sierra Engine Three. You know, it took a, a year or so. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and that was the web generation. So the e-commerce, web commerce generation, right, two thousand three onwards was educating a new generation of people who had no experience of systems, Unix. They're all web, HTML, Ruby on Rails, <clears throat> um, CGI scripts, this kind of thing. That's That was the, the extent of their knowledge about computers. They didn't know how computers worked. Uh, they didn't know about memory and CPU and things like that. And it was those people who ended up with the job of configuring the systems because like, there was a, a huge hiring um, splurge. The industry needed a ton of people suddenly, and they didn't have a ton of experienced people for sure. So they hired anyone they could get hold of, these young kids who didn't really know about system administration. And that meant that they saw no value in that knowledge. They went back to the beginnings like everyone else did, learning to do simple things by hand. When you, instead of doing shell commands, their tools were now Ruby on Rails and Perl or Python or whatever. And the idea that somebody would automate something in a declarative way and then collect all these data about CPUs and memory, what the heck's that? You've just got an infinite amount of it, and we we assume that you know just restart something. It was a totally different culture that arrived around that, and that was what I I believe um, Puppet sort of played into. It, it it dovetailed into that trend. Those Ruby on Rails folks liked it for that reason because they could basically script their heart's content in a language they understood, whereas these concepts about systems that I was explaining or, or trying to develop. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> that was the old god, you know, the graybeards, the wizards of Oz or whatever. And so those guys still got it. They still wanted to buy the new CF engine, but they weren't necessarily the bosses anymore. Um, they were dominated by these teams of web commerce that were generating all the money. So um, I think that kind of reset configuration management and, and what it meant so that it was no longer understood how to do configuration management. So you could sell it again, but you had to sell it in a different way, which is what Puppet and Chef did. And then you see it happened again with uh, Ansible and SaltStack and so on. Mm -hmm. And only those sort of traditional folks really sort of stayed with the CF engine model and appreciated that. I do think that people are starting to come back to it now. There, you see many attempts to reinvent things that are basically CF engine with a new name, uh, not to name any of these things. But people are having exactly the same discussion. It's hilarious. I mean, it's hilarious to me. It's like literally exactly the same words I used 25 years ago or something. Uh, they're, they're starting to use again now. And so I wonder if we will go through another one of these giant um, cycles of time. It does feel like a, a bit of a wheel of time. We are hamsters on at times. Um, so let me see here. Just trying to think about where we are with things. So, so you've, you've been doing this for, for 30 years as well. So you're basically getting on a bit now, right? I'm getting on a bit. I'm... 42 now 
my favorite number. Okay. Yeah, you got to watch that, you know, getting old, it's... Uh... <laughs> Can't seem to stop it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I first came into contact with CF Engine, I mean, right around the time CF Engine 3 was released. I actually found Puppet first, and I was a Puppet user. I was using Puppet at like 0.21, like well pre 1.0 Puppet. And I thought it was amazing. It was great. Look at this declarative way that I can manage my infrastructure. And then, you know, I moved on to another place and um, I had some other challenges. And I talked to Alexei Tololkin. We were at, uh, uh, what is it? Super Lisa, the, Lisa. Lisa. Lisa, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we were at Lisa in I think maybe 2010-ish. Um, and he asked me, why well, I was telling him all about Puppet and all this cool stuff. And he was like, CF Engine. And I'm like, yeah, I've heard of CF Engine. I looked at it briefly. And then we talked about things for a little bit. He was like, well, what do you really care about? And I was like, oh, well, it, my management tool should be lightweight. And I just named off these things. And I just like stopped. And I was like, fine. You're right. So you were actually doing a talk on CF Engine. And so I changed my schedule and I went to that talk and listened to that. And then I was pretty much hooked. I mean, I spent the whole, I was up all night in the hotel room, like playing with it and like, oh, this is super cool. And that's kind of sent me down the path of, of CF Engine and things worked better. I mean, it was much faster and more scalable and you know, there were some some trade-offs uh, as well, but I figured that those trade-offs were were worth it when I was looking at the the variety of systems that I had to deal with and combined with, you know, the things that I cared the most about, you know, efficiency, scalability um, of operation. I didn't want to just like burn every tree in the world just so that I could <laughs> have my file changed or whatever it was, so... Um, so there was this other thing, um, so I'm a little bit curious. So, all right, you, you went on three commercial, you eventually, you know, left the company, but one of the things that I remember you saying before was that, I mean, you really shouldn't have to have CF engine. These things should be handled by the operating system kind of by themselves. And I'm, curious about your view on have we made any progress in that regard you know when i think about the types of things that you know cf engine often does i think about some other things that have come along um a couple of those like system d um you know much shorter time frame for for service management type things and and, and things like that and then NixOS is another one that's kind of been on my radar, you know, declarative system management um, doesn't really have the same declarative management of the running system, just kind of the, I'm going to stamp it out this way, but I was, I was curious if you thought that we had made progress in that regard or not progress um, and, and what you thought about some of those other tools. Hmm. <clears throat> great, uh, great point. I mean, of course, we're always making progress. It, it doesn't always advance in a, in a sort of linear way, but there are these little strange loops from time to time. And that, I think, is because the industry as a whole is not very good at knowledge management um, for whatever reason. But there are these sort of ideas that have stuck from CF Engine, and I I do believe that they <clears throat> that CF Engine was influential in some of these areas because I you know talked to the people <laughs> involved, and I spent a lot of time in the Netherlands apropos um, Nixos and so on <clears throat> and System D. But so some of these ideas like convergence of state, convergence towards a um, a desired outcome. <clears throat> repeatability, so sort of self-healing. <laughs> Excuse me. Self-healing. These things I I think 
have appeared several times. So yes, Nixos, in a, in a sense, does the declarative thingy, the sort of separability, the atomization of independence of, of parts, which is a key key thing in the model for CF engine. System D, I mean, you are, it's, people love and hate System D. I, I didn't know too much about it in the beginning. And then I saw a talk about it in the Netherlands once when I was there and I thought, oh, actually, yeah, it's using some of these proper principles, not bad ideas. I, I think in principle, it's a good idea. Um, and I, I don't have deep knowledge about it, so I couldn't say, you know, what's happened since. But I like the idea that there is this demon managing things precisely because, as you say, I do believe that the operating system should take care of much more than it than it does um, for users. That said, we are now building, of course, other operating systems, meta operating systems in the cloud and cloudy technology, containerization, virtualization. These are very much things that were coming out at, at the time I wrote CF Engine 3. And um, they very much use CF Engine ideas. You know, the, the Google folks use this model of self-healing in Kubernetes. Um, and without that, it becomes very difficult to scale uh, and, and have the kind of robustness that you need when you are when you are using resources that could potentially cost huge amounts of money, you need those things to be safe. And those principles we developed, that people to some extent poo pooed when I when I developed them for CF Engine. You know, who cares if the computer uses slightly more heat this minute than the last minute? But on scale, you you start to realize that you save a lot with that, and uh, you see those those efforts being made in the, the cloud space. Um, if you could... When I <clears throat> went to China the first time and, and talked about promise theory, they were interested in um, the problem of users having too much, you know, unsafe interfaces. They had a case where somebody had been sent to jail because they had a Windows interface, right? And, and it said, do you want to switch off the power grid to the city in the West? And, and he, he just clicked it sort of without thinking and he shut down the, the power for a whole city. And he went to jail for that. And they didn't want that to happen again in the future. You know, you don't want to make governments mad because they will make you suffer. But whenever there are large sums of money involved or, or um, large liability, legal liabilities involved, people become nervous and they, they start to take safety issues more seriously. And I do think CF Engine was a pioneer in these safety issues. So if we make another epic jump, right, from, you know, kind of getting that off the ground and everything, um, I, you've been doing, a, what else have you been doing, you know, recently and like, what are you doing in the next couple of years? I, I know that you had done some work on semantic space time and it's pretty hard to keep up with. I mean, you were doing some talks about business management with promise theory, you know, that it's kind of all over the place. You know, I love uh, variety. I've always enjoyed, I'm just a curious person, I suppose. And I, and I, always like to to see what I can learn about something new. <clears throat> and then from time to time, people come and ask me to, you know, so for example, the business stuff, the agile folks wrote me uh, an email and said, I've just written this book it's called um, Leadership Through Invitation or something like that. And there's a chapter on promise theory. What do you think? And I said, oh, well, that's cool. Um, and this guy, he'd, he'd looked at promise theory and, and thought that this was a great way to formulate some of the ideas in uh, Agile, <clears throat> but he had no sort of mathematical skills. My first thought is, oh, there must be something mathematical I can do here. Let, let me look at this in more detail. And so whenever there's a, a chance for me to explore the ideas that test the theory, um, I sort of jump at it. And it's important because being the sciencey guy, it's 
promise theory wasn't too sciencey in the beginning. <laughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> it was more of a language for expressing things we already knew. But there was there weren't any sort of new testable hypotheses. And it's taken a long time. It's been in the back of my mind for years, you know, what what implications of the principles, what, what could it mean? And that's what's led me down these different avenues into uh, semantic space-time, which was just the observation that in a computer network, space and time are not really like we think of in, in the normal sense. A location is a computer. And then there's a there's just a jump and there's another computer. It's not a continuum of, of locations in between. You're either here or you're there. Or you might be halfway between the two, but but you're not anywhere if you're not in in a computer. And then the links between them give you a graph view, a sort of like a molecular view of space time, which is quite different. And so, what does physics look like in that world? And how do you formulate um, predictions in that kind of background? What are the implications of that for, for example, virtualization? How do things move? When a, when a job is sort of migrated from computer to computer, it's a kind of motion. If the thing is moving, what are the implications of that? If it's moving fast enough, does it mean, you know, it, special relativity becomes important and, and so on? So many questions that you need to ask when you take seriously the kind of scale that we're now beginning to reach with, with cloud computing. You know, I wrote this many years ago in the computer immunology paper, um, saying that biology was quite a good, um, something we could learn from, but you know, at the moment we've, we've just got hundreds of computers, maybe thousands, it's too small to be com comparable to biology, which has got billions of cells. But we're growing pretty fast now, you know, like some slime mold, uh, IT is growing to cover, to become pretty large. And we're now reached millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of computers, billions of devices. So it really is an issue that we need to think about what it means in a virtual sense when things, jobs migrate and so on. So that's what led me to semantic space time. And I eventually wrote a popular book about that because <clears throat> I learned the hard way that if you get too technical too early, people just sort of write it off and say, yeah, whatever. I wanted people to understand the issues. And actually it leads very nicely into um, the knowledge management structures. And that leads very nicely into AI and neural networks and all of those things. <coughs> so promise theory gives you a way of linking all of those things in a single framework. Then um, just recently, something very surprising happened. Um, I was looking for some work because, you know, COVID sort of reset a lot of the, the clocks and jobs on projects. A lot of things got canceled. A lot of people got fired. It's difficult times. But a very interesting organization called MLNet, again, a Dutch um, out, uh, a foundation sort of spring out of MLNet, the service provider. Um, sponsors research projects, usually open source development, but but it was suggested to me that I might look into the meaning of trust because it's kind of a promise theory kind of thing. And trust, everyone believes that trust is important in security and so on, but security people, pretty simple-minded folks, they think that trust is a kind of crypto token that you have, you know, if you've got this token, you're trusted, done, finished, you're good. End of story. If you haven't got it, well, you're very suspicious indeed, and we won't talk to you. But so it's it's like the old SSH thing, right? You log into your machine for the first time, it says, danger, Will Robinson, uh, illegal, possibly illegal thing happening. This person from unknown address contacting you it has this fingerprint, this long, scary number. Do you want to accept this? Be very, very careful. And people go, yeah, whatever. Because what else are you going to do? And then you're trusted, done, end of story. <clears throat> but I thought there must be a better way to understand trust than this. So I 
looked for some data. Could could we study something and do some natural science on this? I had so promise theory predicted what trust should be. How can I test this? And I had I had sort of hit upon the idea of using Wikipedia because it's a it's a open platform and it's one of the few open platforms where you can just download the data and analyze it. And I started to do this and uh, started to write up the experiments. I had no idea what I was going to find. The trust idea certainly seemed to sort of pan out, but I started to notice something about the way that people work together in groups, which actually went back to some of the agile uh, management stuff, but even farther back to something that I remembered reading when I was um, a young lecturer, a British anthropologist called Robin Dunbar, who's now famous for the Dunbar number, had made this prediction by studying the behaviors of monkeys and primates, not the religious kind, but the, you know, the, the ape-like kind. Uh, he had had this hypothesis that the size of our brains are basically, our brains are basically there to handle social interactions, right? Social interactions are kind of expensive. You have to talk to people, keep in touch with them. You have to remember who they are, recognize their face and so on. So it requires a certain amount of processing power to process a relationship. And in these groups, if you've got a small brain, probably you can handle a smaller number of people than if you have a large brain. And he plotted the mass of the neocortex, you know, the, the, the modern brain, um, against the size of the social groups that these monkeys lived in. And it was a perfect straight line. And he extrapolated that line to the mass of a human brain and came up with this number, 150, which is about the size of friends you would expect a human to have. <clears throat> this was 20 odd years ago. And since then, a lot of research has been done to kind of show that humans do indeed have these group sizes. <coughs> but it's more complicated than that because we also have more sort of models of, of interaction than, than maybe animals do. And we can have 150 sort of people you maybe send a Christmas card to kind of friends in our social circle. But well, we might know, you know, maybe 6,000 or 600, 600 rather. On the other hand, we can only work with about 30 at a time before it starts to break apart. And we only tend to sit around a, a communal dinner table with about 15. And our intimate friends are, you know, like three to five. So maybe because we put much more effort into an intimate relationship than a less intimate relationship, we need to use more of our brains and so there's kind of like a CPU cost of um, maintaining these things in power. So that was Dunbar's hypothesis, and he struggled to find evidence for that because, of course, to do any experiment in social science is very, very hard, and repeatability is almost impossible. To repeat the experiment under the same conditions is almost impossible. But then... <coughs> on me. Without intending to, I realized that Wikipedia is the perfect example of this. So what happens in Wikipedia is that people come together, edit some pages. And my first thought was, you know, people cooperate because humans are good, decent beings, ethical, um, happy, friendly people that come together to help one another in beautiful harmony. And this is why we form social groups. And of course, it's not, it's not that at all. The data clearly showed that somebody will come along and start a page and somebody will come along to fight them and to disagree with them and make changes. And then somebody else will come along and, and so on. And these groups will start to grow because of mistrust. It's not because they trust each other and they want to help each other. If they trust each other to just leave each other to leave each other be to get on with it, it's because they don't trust each other. They become and inspect and pay attention to what's going on. And they buzz around in, a, in a, an angry ball for a while, and then they kind of get sick of it and they go away. So this is very episodic thing that happens. People come together in a group, bzz, 
flies apart, flies apart. And you can measure the, the length and frequency of these episodes. And I thought, this is very promise theory. So I derived a, a formula for how I thought it should work from promise theory. And the fit was just perfect. You couldn't have a, a better fit if you tried. Uh, predicting the, uh, the most likely size of these groups um, and, and the spectrum of, of different cases. But more interesting than that, I realized that there were two scales in this formula, uh, and they corresponded exactly to this, this hierarchy of scales in Dunbar's work. And so I wrote to Robin Dunbar and said, hey, look at this. This is exactly what you said, and I even have a formula that predicts why it works, which she hadn't had before. And so now we've written a couple of papers on, on how this trust works, and it falls straight out of this these basic principles of promise theory uh, and the idea that trust is not the important thing, but actually mistrust is the thing that drives human cooperation. It's because we don't trust each other and we, we're paying attention to what we do uh, that causes us to align with each other. Because if we weren't paying attention, we'd just be all over the place. <clears throat> so that was kind of an unexpected thing that popped out of my work uh, these last couple of years, which I found very interesting. And I would love to do more of these things if I could, but, um, you know, life now is, um, as I approach the dawn of my years, life becomes, you have to pay the bills and then you have to have a bit of fun as well. And the number of things that I do for fun is quite, quite uh, broad. So, um, I'm hoping that there will be more of these exciting projects that I can spend time on uh, before it, before I give up the ghost. That's a, that's a really interesting insight. Um, I had never thought about trust in that way before. That's so actually the thing I didn't mention was that when these guys from Agile contacted me and, and had written a little bit about promise theory, I went back and actually, so I joined them and did some teaching with them for a while. But I <clears throat> I wanted to use promise theory to decompose some of the dynamics in these social groups. So what's the meaning of authority? What is the meaning of um, identity? And um, what, what is a service that you do for somebody else? You know, there's a few, there are these eight things that the Open Leadership Network describes for agile interactions. <clears throat> and I basically define them all with models and promise theory. And I realized that it would allow you to make predictions. Um, so it actually gives you a way to, to approach social science in a new way. Not just, you know, social scientists basically ask questions. People, you know, what do you think this is? What do you think that is? And they do statistics based on that because they don't have any sort of objective way or models on which to pin the ideas to form hypotheses, except to do questionnaires. What do you think about this? But it turns out that you can short circuit a lot of that. And actually, by identifying these more sort of atomic phenomena like authority, service, um, trust, you can define these things much more clearly than you thought you could, thanks to promise theory. And therefore you can go back and, and with a bit of ingenuity, maybe try to measure things in a new way. And this trust was the first, first example of that, which actually, you know, came up with a positive result. So maybe social science is something interesting as well. That's also part of my science fiction heritage, you know, with Harry Seldon and the foundation uh, um, story, of course. Yeah, I just re uh, re listened to the Foundation saga recently. Um, it's one of my favorites. Um, so we, I mean, we actually had a question. Um, I see that. I'm gonna. Well, go ahead. We can do it later. Or we can do it now. Go ahead. Um, I was gonna ask a couple more questions and then turn to that one. Yeah. All right. So, well, 
you clearly live in the future. It's it's only 10 a.m. here. I know it's like after four or something like that there. Um, what do you what do you see for the rest of us who don't live in the future? I mean, do you do you see anything big coming? I mean, you mentioned AI and, and all of these things. I mean, is there something unexpected that you feel on the horizon or Oh, you know, this last year, everyone and their dog has been trying to get me to do AI, deep learning, generative, this and that and the rest of it. I actually have zero interest in that. Um, and I'll tell you why. First of all, because everyone's doing it. Uh, and it requires enormous resources, which I don't have. But also everybody's doing it rather uncritically in order to be one of those people who's doing it. And that's always been an, an, a, something that's made me want to go in the other direction. I think there are a lot of basic questions in, in computer science we still have to answer, not just computer science, in sociology and all of these areas. There are many interesting questions that, that I could possibly work on, would love to work on, which are still important. AI will turn out to be a, you know one of those um, on me, um, glitches in history, a blip. It, we got excited for a year and then we realized, ah, oh, it's not that cool. There's another new thing coming in a few years time. But there's still a lot of important questions to answer. Um, I always go to the fundamentals. You know, whenever you're trying to understand something, forget about trying to do the to be at the end of the train, go right back to the beginning and look at the fundamentals. Because if you don't understand that, you will never make progress on the rest of it. Even in AI, actually I did a, a, a little bit of work a few years ago about how to identify the formation of concepts in AI. Because what we're good at doing is sort of passing a stream of text or uh, recognizing objects in a video. Or, these are basically pattern recognition things. We're also quite good at generating patterns uh, now. And that's extremely impressive. And I don't think I could do anything better than anyone else is doing. So who cares? Let them do it. But no one really understands where the meaning comes from in these things that they're generating. It's It's all... It's still us, the receiver, that generates the meaning. These machines have got no idea what they're talking about. They're just you know, spitting out streams of patterns. And we find the meaning in it. But how does that happen? That's still a very interesting question. And a couple of years ago, I got invited to the Kavli Institute, the foundation in, in, America, in Los Angeles. They do neuroscience and a bunch of other things. But uh, I was invited by a couple of neuroscientists who who we'd kind of read each other's book on space-time uh, because it turns out that there's a space-time angle to understanding how the brain works as well, uh, which is somewhat similar to the notion of virtual um, structures in, in, <coughs> in my promise theory space-time, semantic space-time. Um, there are a lot of interesting problems there that I think uh, are worth studying and I want to uh, work on. I hope somebody else will step away from the... <coughs> Sorry, losing my voice a bit now. I hope that they will step away from some of those uh, cliches or, or bandwagon things that people are doing now with generative AI. You know, if you can glue generative AI to any product, that, you know, people will do it now. But I don't see it lasting very long because it will. Um, there's no real reason to do it except to make something cool. Okay. It's a uh, yeah. It's quite resource intensive. That's for certain. So, what's coming in the future? Now, I suppose if you could step into your TARDIS and go back in time. Was there anything that you would change or do differently? <laughs> oh. 
I would definitely say yes to some things I said no to. Um, <laughs> I might have sold my house at a different time than I than I did. <laughs> um, no, I mean you. I don't believe in looking back and regretting things. I things turn out for a reason and you basically deal with the choices that you made you make you always make them in good faith and there's no going back so there's no point in in thinking otherwise i think i i more or less did okay with the things that i tried to do i think they all turned out not too bad I mean, they're still still rolling in, in many different directions as far as I'm concerned. Um, I, think I hope so. Uh, um, the big love of my life, the first love of my life, and it's all been throughout, has been music, of course. Um, you know, before I ever got involved, interested in science, I, I got interested in music. And I've always been interested in big music, sort of orchestral, prog rock, uh, orchestras, symphonic music. And these past years, thanks to my, <clears throat> my wonderful partner, I've had some opportunities to develop the music a little bit more than I could do before and spend a bit of time. And that COVID also helped because suddenly there was, there was time. <laughs> so actually the thing that I would love to succeed at in the future is is for people to like my music more <laughs> so if if you're out there go and check out my uh, music channel on spotify or whatever you listen to and and watch out for that other mark burgess because there's another one an imposter who isn't me you know, the real music is uh, from my that's awesome um all right so we do have uh, a question here kind of going back to some of the trust and mistrust. Thinking about working under mistrust, is there some sort of connection between promise theory and OCAP, object capability model, and related work by Mark Sam Miller? Yeah, um, I have no idea is the, sim is the short answer to that. <clears throat> I think I probably saw that model some time ago. And probably, yes, there's a connection. The thing about promise theory is it's not like, you know, theories are things that are descriptive and, and they tend to overlap with other theories. So just because promise theory says this doesn't mean it's total contradiction to the, some other theory, which is in contradiction to promise theory. If it didn't sort of agree with the predominance of thought in a bunch of things, it would be wrong. So, so you wouldn't be too interested in it. So I hope it agrees with these um, these other theories <clears throat> and gives a deeper, hopefully a deeper insight into them uh, because of the way it's formulated. Often people have theories, ideas, they don't quite know how to handle the technicalities of a sort of a mathematical approach or something like this. This is where I have a slight advantage coming from a, a mathematical physics background. It hasn't been easy, but you know, by persevering it, and with a bit of good luck, <laughs> I have to say, I have been able to make a little bit of progress uh, in in this. I would like to make much more, and I would love for other people to take the ideas and do what you do with science, which is to develop it yourself and take it in new directions as well without my help. So yes, of course, there are actually a lot of uh, things that promise theory overlaps with. Uh, the other one people talk about a lot is the actor model, which is uh, you know popular in object-oriented frameworks, um, which is sort of an implementation of agents, um, but with um, a sort of an opinionated idea about how to make messages flow between these agents. And what promise theory does is it's not an alternative to, to actor model, Using promise theory, you can describe and understand the actor model, 
and see that all of those things map very in a very simple way to promise theory. So it's close in its sort of construction to promise theory, but it's not a different thing. Promise theory is something which has no opinion about what you should or shouldn't do. It's simply a way of deciding what might be a good way to do it or might not be using these objective model criteria to be able to evaluate these things and according to different ways and then make that policy decision based on some other criteria. So a theory is basically a tool for answering questions. Is this a good, is this a well-posed problem or not a well-posed problem? Uh, whereas these, these models in computer science, actor model, loco model, whatever they are, they tend to be design principles. You should do it in this certain way because this is better than the other guys think. And that's um, that's hopefully what promise theory is there to help determine, if that makes sense. It does to me. I uh, I mean, I can't hack all of the math with promise theory. I mean, it did take me six months to read In Search of Certainty, um, but I feel like those are the conversations that I have with people <laughs> pretty much when we approach when I approach any problem. <laughs> it it kind of seeps into um, a lot of the things. But I don't want to keep you too much longer. I know that you're sick and I appreciate you joining us. Um, Pleasure is mine. Did we, did we have any more questions on the, the list? Uh, I don't see any that have popped up here. Anybody else have any questions that they would like to ask? I'd like to I'd like to express appreciation and <clears throat> kind of amplify like the fact that you mentioned several things that were very interesting to me that I experienced myself. Like you mentioned uh, the kind of uh, university realm where everybody, like they're herding cats. And I also was kind of a sysadmin developer person at a university computer science department. And it just like, it shocked me into remembering how there were these many professors that taught different computer science related uh, facets and each of them had a huge, strong opinion about must be this way, must be this way, must be that way. And it was, uh, yeah, so I just really appreciated that another person had experienced such an interesting environment. <laughs> um, thanks again, Mark. It was really a pleasure to have you on. And thank you for everything. CF Engine, Promise Theory, Dinners. It's uh, it's been great. And, and thank you as well, Nick. You've been a good friend to me, certainly for for many years, even as you are getting on. And uh, <laughs> Lynn says hi, and uh, we hope to have a foodie dinner with you next time you're around. Oh, it's great! I can't wait. <laughs> Thanks everybody else for joining us as we wrap up another episode. We'll see you next time. <laughs>